Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to my channel. My name is Paul, the Canadian Snowman, back here with part two, uh, Battle of the Three Kings. So, uh, if you haven't seen part one, I would definitely recommend uh, uh, the previous video or a couple of videos ago. Uh, I did the part one of the Battle of the Three Kings, and it pretty much sets you up for this, the, for what's about to happen. Like, this is the battle, the battle, battle, the big, you know battle <laughs> uh and yeah and to kind of get you your mind set on what's going on definitely recommend watching the previous uh part one of battle of three kings but anyway definitely interesting so basically the battle of three kings uh i thought they're like all three would be like on a, like on a different side but then you know they got the i guess you know, the christians coming from, from the north coming down and they're going to be against you know the two kings man my mind's blank now what how this, you know, anyways, I'm sure they're going to give us a, maybe a quick little brief setup of what happened in the previous episode here. But anyways, guys, please hit that like and subscribe button below. And we'll jump into it. I'm really looking forward to this awesome battle. I hope it's really awesome anyway. I hope it's just not like a one-sided deal. Like, I really hope that there's some back and forth and everything. And there's some epic things happening. I think it'd be really cool. But, uh, you never know. You should always have your, I guess, your expectations down low. So, you know, you, you know what I'm saying? Like and subscribe, please. And for those who don't know, this is History March. Awesome channel. Definitely check out their stuff. I like to have a little bit, little, little bit of comedy with their, you know, with their uh, videos, which I really like. It's serious, but there is a, a you know, touch of comedy. Before we continue the story of the Three Kings, I'm very happy to say that we partnered up with Blinkist for this video. If you love history like I do, you'll know that there are too many books to read in too little time. Without too much scouting ahead, when the Portuguese army crossed the river, they were bewildered by the large numbers of tribal cavalry and infantry that were assembling across the field. Huh. King Sebastian immediately decided that the only tactical option for his much smaller force of 23,000 was to form into a vast square. In the center, the wagon train was formed as a fort to protect the camp followers and provide a central anchor for the army. Portuguese regiments formed the flanks and rear of the square, mixed with contingents of cavalry and professional troops to boost their morale and keep the men in line. But it makes me think that they're expecting, like, you know, an attack from the side here. Uh, but uh, good thing I'm not no, like a uh, general or anything, because, you know, I, I immediately think, oh my God, you're, you're setting yourself up to be surrounded. And, you know, I, I, and you're going to have no link, you know, and you're just going to get, I don't know, starved out or something like that because you're, you have no way to kind of retreat, you know. But I guess maybe that's kind of a good thing because then your your men are gonna fight to get your butt out of to get their butts out of there. Uh, but it's definitely I forget which video it was. The, this was a tactic very common. I forget which series that was a part of where they this was their tactic. They did this all the time. You know, dang it, I wish I remembered it. But anyways, uh, it is it's definitely I've, I've definitely seen this before. This kind of tactic before. I just forget. But anyway, it, it just seems kind of odd to me. Anyways, you're outnumbered, dude. We, we got up your sleeve, buddy. And professional yes. troops to boost their morale and keep the men in line. The front of the square was a formidable force formed by experienced German and Italian mercenaries and other volunteers armed with arquebuses who were trained to shoot and reload behind the protection of the wall of German pikemen. In addition, aiming to break up a potential massive charge by the Moroccans, Sebastian placed a series of wooden forts made of wagons which bristled with sharpshooters. Huh. Finally, an elite shock regiment of heavy cavalry was drawn up in the front. Although vastly out... That's very cool. I didn't really think of the like, little forts from the high behind. So they're pretty much set. Like, they're not moving. Like, they're... You know, they're gonna let the other ones be the aggressors. They're just gonna hunker down and try and basically kill them as they approach, and hopefully, you know, destroy them as they get closer. Right? It pretty much seems like 
their strategy. Numbered, Sebastian's army was better equipped and more technologically advanced. Yeah, which is usually the case, you know, when you're out when the when when one side's outnumbered, uh, it's usually always you know they, they usually you know, if they have the same tactics and everything and they're on the same ground, it may make no sense to even go into battle because you you'd lose. But if you have you know, the better armor or tactics or or weapons or whatnot, like that that's a, that's definitely evens the playing field out. Like we've seen that so many times in past videos, but. Yeah, looking forward to this for sure. Ashton's army was better equipped and more technologically advanced. On the other side of the field, the 50,000 strong Moroccan army formed a crescent shape. In the center, disciplined infantry and arquebusiers were arrayed in two lines, each several ranks deep. To either side were Moroccan townsmen, as well as renegades from Spain and Turkey. The third line was formed of Berber soldiers and cavalrymen on the flanks. Realizing that the Crusaders were better equipped and possessed technologically superior weaponry, Sultan Abd al-Malik rode out to galvanize the men. You must oppose the Crusaders with valor, for you fight for your families, your life and your honor. And should you die today, you will be led into paradise. With their confidence raised, the troops. At least, like you know, he he know he acknowledges that you know the other guys you know are better equipped. You know, he's not like, oh, we got them. Their their stuff is nothing. Like he does realize this, and you know, boosting his men's morale. So you know, definitely good. You know, props to him for you know, you know, rallying the troops and realizing that. But anyways. Paradise. With their confidence raised, the troops cheered Al Malik's name as he rejoined the ranks. But no one knew the Sultan's secret, which was that he was dying. Suffering from either the plague or camp fever, the progress of the disease was accelerated by horse riding for several hundred kilometers in a forced march to reach the battlefield. Only the Sultan's brother and his faithful Jewish doctor knew the true personal costs that the Sultan would pay. Wow. And reaching the limit of his skills, the doctor could only use his art to give the Sultan another day or two of vigor, urging him to rest. But Abd al-Malik wow. refused to retire to his tent, insisting that there must not be even a hint of suspicion about his illness in order to preserve the morale of the troops. Knowing totally agree with that. Totally agree. If they know he's dying, the troops' morale, and they're, they're going to be second-guessing what they're going through, you know, that their leader is going to be dead. But, like, you know, it, it definitely makes perfect sense. I would do the same thing. And it's, it's, at least he has people to turn to to keep his secret. And his brother is, is going to know, okay, you know, my, my brother's about to pass away. i got to take on the reins. Like, he's going to be prepared for this. So that's definitely cool and, like, awesome, you know with that dynamic man i'm thinking you know like if you know you're about to die go to the front lines like if you think that you're you know if you have any doubts that you might lose this battle maybe in the middle, the middle of the battle like take the front line just charge in there you know and just have your in your manner be like hell yeah our leader's going in we're going in too i don't know <laughs> i wonder if he's gonna do that you know charge in the front lines you know when he had little time left he embraced his brother ahmed with whom he experienced decades of exile and spilled blood at Lepanto and Tunis and told him to fight, conquer, or die. Yeah. There was no more time to waste. No more time to waste, except for eating a chocolate bar, apparently. All right. Peter, nobody's here. We're Did talking I get the on the off? phone. No, you, you Sorry. Artillery of the two armies sounded off in full force, but needed to spend a couple of hours drawing closer to find the range. Then an hour before noon, the whole Crusader army knelt together as one in one last prayer. 
I'm kind of curious if the Crusaders, you know, they have, they have the better equipment. I I think that their cannons would have like a longer range, but I guess I guess they, they may I guess they have the same cans. Uh, that just you know went through my head. When they rose, the Portuguese elite shock cavalry leapt forth first on King Sebastian's command, followed by the Castilian crack infantry regiment. The king, though vastly outnumbered, decided to utilize his superior troops and strike decisively in order to avoid being overwhelmed by the enemy, knowing that his elite shock cavalry could single-handedly break and rout an enemy army many times their numbers. Wow. As the okay. ground trembled under the hooves of the Crusader cavalry, Moroccan arquebusiers fired. Although their volleys were effective, the long reload time allowed Sebastian's crack troops to close the distance. As the Crusaders flung themselves into Al Malik's center, the Moroccan division in the front was broken instantly. The second line could not hold the Crusader charge and was pushed back. And as the Oh my god, they're gonna get engulfed in, in though, man. Like, these are your best guys right here. Like, he's just gonna swallow them whole and bring these guys around and they're just gonna get slaughtered, right? Castilian infantry joined the fighting. The Moroccan center was thrown into confusion. Al Malik leapt forward with his bodyguards to help prevent the line from faltering, signaling the third line to reinforce the center. As the unstoppable Crusader heavy cavalry hacked through the enemy center, the Muslims held on by a thread, and it seemed like their cohesion would break at any moment. Leading from the front, Al Malik and his regiment of experienced bodyguards, helped by the counterattack of Berber infantry from the third line, finally blunted the brave Crusader assault. And now, Seeing that Sebastian's best troops were locked in ferocious fighting with his center, the Sultan gave the signal to his brother. Waves of tribal horsemen emerged from behind the small gentle hills and undulated land of the valley, led by Ahmad al-Mansur. The impetus of the seemingly stunned Crusader cavalry had gone, as the gravity of the situation became clear, with nearly 20,000 tribal horsemen now surging forward. The elite Christian troops began fighting their way back towards the main line to escape Al Malik's trap, realizing that their forward push was now in vain. The Sultan. I'm gonna say, yeah, get your butts out of there, man. Like, I'm, sur I'm surprised they charged anyway, just because. Uh... Yeah, they, they, they're all going to die. Like, I can't see. Like, these guys are going to catch them, right? I mean, I think these guys are going to get slaughtered, man. Sultan ordered his infantry to envelop the Crusader vanguard, and with his personal regiment of bodyguards, he disengaged from the fighting to join his brother's cavalry attack that was bearing down on the Portuguese defensive square. Sebastian and his officers encouraged the men knowing that what was soon to come would be a fight to the death. Meanwhile, in the Crusader vanguard, some of the Castilian elite infantry was trampled as the heavy cavalry was trying to retreat, and their situation was becoming increasingly desperate, with Moroccan troops now coming from all sides. Exactly. But Sebastian replied by launching a cavalry attack of his own. As the Portuguese infantry parted to allow the mounted knights to pass through, the king led his nobles and their retinues, as well as the cavalry contingent of the deposed Sultan Abdallah Mohammed, directly towards Al Malik's banner, knowing that if he could strike the Sultan down, the battle would be won. Sebastian yeah. smashed into Al Malik's contingent. The ferocious charge allowed the king's retinue to cut their way through to within a few meters of the sultan, who used the last ounce of his strength to draw his sword and join the fighting. Blows were traded back and forth, and for a few moments the fate of Morocco hung in the balance, as one by one the Islamic standards fell around the sultan. 
but the steadfast bodyguards held their ground and managed to rally around their leader. Wow. Sebastian's audacious attack was broken. Over the next several hours, regiments of Al Malik's dragoons came in wave after wave, firing their. Yeah, the Sultan, though, man, like, he held his own. I know he had a bodyguard around him, but. And like I said, it's definitely cool that he took the front lines and went after. But I also realized that's a big risk because, yeah, if he, if he goes down, the, his, his army is going to be like, uh oh, like, we're, we're probably losing. They might retreat. So, I man, he held his own, man. Good job by the Sultan. Iraq regiments of Al Malik's dragoons came in wave after wave, firing their aquabuses at the Portuguese square. They were trained to gallop towards the enemy, and just before hitting the pikes, their horses would pirouette, enabling their riders to shoot at point blank range before riding back out of harm's way to reload and renew the attack. The Portuguese put up a valiant fight as the pikemen held their ground and aquabusiers shot deadly volleys at the incoming enemy, cutting down nearly 7,000 Moroccan troops. But as the hours passed, their numbers dwindled and their ammunition dried up. Sebastian was seen fighting in person, and despite being wounded, he carried on inspiring his men to hold their ground. It is said that three horses were slain from under him and that his bodyguards were reduced to but a few men. Wow. At some point in the battle, the king too fell while fighting. That's By it. dusk, 8,000 Christian troops lay dead on the field and 15,000 were captured, with less than 100 managing to escape the carnage, including the former Sultan Muhammad, who either died during the battle or drowned in the river whilst trying to flee. With blood on his white garments, Abd al-Malik stood victoriously, looking every bit the leader his people needed. Yet he was close to collapsing. His robes were hiding the fact that he was strapped to his saddle, as he would otherwise not have been able to ride his horse in battle. With the disease that was about to kill him, it was miraculous that he found the strength to take active part in the fighting. Moments later, with the battle still ongoing, Sultan Abd al-Malik closed his eyes, drew his last breath, before gently slumping forward in his saddle. Damn. Props to him, though, man. He outlasted the other king. And it was one of those things, you know, adrenaline probably just kicked in. And once he knew, like, his his people had won, he's like, okay, I, I can rest easy now. I did what I needed to do. And then he just like, okay. And he just basically let himself go, you know. So, you know, that's, that's awesome. Three kings fell on that August the 4th. 1578. As so that's why they get called like the three battle of three of the three like three because the three kings died. The few survivors trickled in. The news of the defeat paralyzed the kingdom of Portugal and would have disastrous consequences. The country was deeply in debt and unable to pay for crippling financial reparations demanded by the Morocco venture. Almost every noble family suffered a slain family member, while some families were entirely extinguished as a result of the battle. To make Damn. matters worse, after King Sebastian's death, the House of Aviz, which had ruled Portugal for 200 years, was overthrown by a Castilian military invasion. The dethroned Sultan Mohammed II was reportedly thrown in the river from his horse while he was trying to flee the battle although it is possible that he was killed in the fighting. Meanwhile, Sultan Abd al-Malik was succeeded by his brother, Ahmad al-Mansur, who went on to rule Morocco for the next 25 years, becoming the most famous of all Saudi rulers. Huh. Ahmad was a highly influential figure in both Europe and Africa in the 16th century. The powerful army he had built up and Morocco's key strategic position made him an important power player during the late Renaissance period. He was described by his contemporaries as a man of profound Islamic learning, 
a true lover of books, calligraphy and mathematics, and he was known as a connoisseur of mystical texts, as well as an avid participant in scholarly discussions. Wow. In many ways, his reign ushered a golden period in the history of Morocco. Credit goes to our awesome patrons who make videos like this one possible. Consider joining them to support our... Well, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say, before I like, get my thoughts in here, one source notes now that Portuguese nobility were ill-suited for the rigors of the campaign in, in enemy con country. Instead of sharpening their weapons, they embroidered their clothes instead of... Well, instead of corsets, they dress in doublets adorned with silk and gold. The, they eat sweets and fine foods rather than biscuits, water that would help them fare better in them rocking. Okay, so they they just they came ill prepared when it came to like you know their bodies and stuff like that. What they ate? Wow, and I'm sure like definitely played a big role there. But they, they were surrounded, and they, they got. They just got swallowed up, but just the, the numbers that the number game actually kicked in there at the end. And plus, when the you know, when their king died, I'm sure like the morale of people just you know, finally you know, slowly, you know, and you know evaporated. But you know, I wonder like because you uh, eight like eight thousand six eight thousand dead, and then there was like twice as many were captured. And would they have been like been sold like been into slavery you know amongst you know the people there you know been sold off as slaves or were they, were they traded you know captives with them you know with portugal i'm not sure uh but yeah sebastian you know dying it definitely like had this huge negative effect though on portugal man i mean the guy was brave but i think a little reckless you know yeah he just like jump into situations i think you know without Maybe putting as much thought into it. I mean, I, I'm a backseat driver here, kind of saying, you know, what I was, I'm thinking, you know, obviously I'm not a leader. I don't know what was going on there, but and that's just kind of an initial reaction. Uh, and so as people kind of had yeah, the, the big debt that they were, you know, his people, because people were expected him to win and then bring these riches back and probably everything be all fine to pay for everything. But then when they lost, man, it just, I guess is I guess it's a big downtime for Portugal. I guess you know because you now everyone was they were poor and new people came in the lead. I guess, but anyways, uh, the Sultan man went down like a warrior. Apparently, his brother was a great leader, and so it kind of had you know the opposite effect on each side. It seemed like you know they're you know Morocco. You know, I, I guess they were struggling there at the beginning. Of like you know and and then now they're they entered the golden age and it was opposite for portugal they seemed like they were in their kind of golden age and then it flipped and then they're you know things were bad for them uh but anyways guys great series great two-part series you know i like these very very awesome i like that in the first episode was introduction and the second one was the big battle you know you jumped right into the big battle and i wasn't disappointed it was a really good battle it wasn't just like bam done deal i mean I, I kind of don't really understand the tactics of Sebastian sending, you know, his troops down the middle. It, it, it just looks so obvious that they were just going to come, like, uh, surrounded there. Like, or uh, maybe I thought when he sent those tr troops in, maybe he would send the rest of his army in, maybe, to kind of, but then he's outnumbered. I don't know. Just, it, it just seemed, seemed kind of odd to me, but obviously I'm not a professional. You know, professional learning the tactics back then, obviously. But anyways, guys, please hit that like and subscribe. Hope you guys enjoyed this. And I'll catch you guys in future videos. Always a blast. And yeah, you guys have a good day, good night. And I'm out of here. Peace.